So when we're talking about flow through an aquifer, we're talking about uh, flow through porous media. And this flow is mainly uh, horizontal flow. Um, when you're talking about chapter seven in infiltration, things like that, that's when it's talking about vertical flow, but this is just going to be mostly horizontal flow. We're still going to use um, the Darcy equation. So, um, which tells us that Q is uh, negative K um, DH DZ, where previously K um, used to be a function, so this used to be a function of soil moisture content. This is this was the brooks corey equation, but now in this case we have uh, we're fully saturated. So now theta is equal to theta s, which was our porosity. And S, our relative saturation, is equal to 1. Therefore, the K in this equation, so K is going to be our saturated hydraulic conductivity. OK. And of course, this K uh, is going to be a function of soil type, just like it, it was before. Okay, um, so we can use our, um, uh, our Darcy's, Darcy's law, Darcy's equation. We can substitute our H is equal to P over gamma plus Z. Um, we can also say that most flow is in the X and Y direction. So um, we're talking about lateral movement again. Um, and so you end up with uh, a, a Q in the Z and a Q in the Y direction. And this is pretty typical for flow through um, our aquifers. So I'm eventually going to get into the derivation of uh, this flow equation. Um, so before we do that, I want to talk about store, the storage parameters. So storage and aquifer. Okay. So in an unconfined aquifer, uh, our storage changes associated with um, water table depth um, requires a storage parameter called, and this is going to be called specific yield. or SY, where specific yield is considered the volume of groundwater released per unit change in a water table depth. per unit area. And it has no units, and it typically ranges um, from 0 0.05 to 0 0.35. Let's see that list. Okay. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to our um, specific yield, it has uh, limits. So this is just a typical range, but it typically ranges from, again, that 0 0.05 SY. And it, its maximum 
is going to be uh, the storage, I'm sorry, the porosity. So the upper limit is porosity. Okay. Um, so that's going to be the specific yield for uh, the storage parameter for an unconfined aquifer. Okay. Now for a confined aquifer, it's a little bit different. So the confined aquifer, um, storage changes correspond mainly to compression of the aquifer as the overlying weight of soil um, material is transferred from the liquid to solid grains. Oops. So there's a slight change in porosity due to this compression. And our parameter is called specific storage. S sub S. So S sub S is considered um, the change in porosity divided by the change in piezometric head. And the specific storage ranges from five times 10 to the negative five to five times 10 to the negative three. And this is uh, per meter. Okay, so these are, these are the storage parameters that are associated um, with the two different types of aquifers. So now we're gonna go into the development of the groundwater flow equation. Okay. Okay, so let's see, how much of this do I wanna go over? Um, let's just start here. So mathematically, you would have a mass storage change so change in mass with respect to time is going to be some divergent parameter multiplied by gamma Q with respect to X, Y, Z, okay? So this is going to be your volumetric flux per unit area. This is going to be your change in volume. This is called your divergence operator. And this is your mass, um, this is your mass storage change. Okay, so according to the this equation, you're saying that your mass storage change is going to be a function of essentially how much of that water is entering and exiting some, some volume, okay, some, some uh, finite volume. Now, everything on the right-hand side of the equation is essentially your, your, your convergence of your mass flux, so how your mass flux is moving around and changing with respect to time. Um, this is Sim we can actually pull in our definition um, of specific storage to expand on this equation. So DMDT is density S sub S DH DT, delta X, delta Y, 
in delta C. Um, and so in this case, we can assume, we can make some assumptions about uh, density. So we can assume that the density of water is essentially constant. Um, this will change, this would be a different equation and, and a different approach entirely if we're talking about um, a contaminated plume moving through the subsurface. Um, then you would have to use your diffusion, advection dispersion, advection dispersion equations to calculate that movement, but we're just talking about movement of water through the subsurface. Okay, so then um, we can equate to the left, this, this side, here with this here and get a simplification of our equation and we get density s sub s dh dt delta x delta y delta z is negative density dx dy dz convergence of q so this essentially crosses out our change in volume from both sides of the equation. This also removes our density parameter from both sides of the equation. And we're left with S of S dH dt, which is going to be equal to negative d dx qx minus d dy qy minus d dz qz. So these parameter, these parts come from this divergence um, parameter. It just essentially is, is, is um, applying a d to each direction x, y, and z of your, um, your flux here. Okay, so now is where we can actually substitute in our Darcy law into each of these. So sub Darcy law, where Q is um, our negative K D H D, whichever you're taking uh, with respect to, it could be DX, DY, DZ, and substitute that in there to get S sub S D H D T, which is going to be, now just bringing to your attention this negative uh, here. When you multiply a negative by a negative, you're gonna get a positive. So essentially all of these components are gonna turn positive. So I'm just kind of gonna highlight that. So we get plus D DX KX DH DX plus D DY KY DH dy plus d dz kz dh dz okay so this is the the starting no, a starting point this is where we start branching off into our um specific equations for uh, an unconfined and a confined aquifer this is your starting point here okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to break these into parts so I'm going to call this part one. I'm going to call this part two. I'm going to call this part three and part four. Now I'm going to draw this picture now. I forgot to draw the picture first, but that's okay. I'm going to draw this picture now where we're going to compare a confined and an unconfined aquifer. So here we have So this bottom part, we can call this bedrock or another confining layer. Again, confining layers just means that there's no movement through that, that layer. It's essentially uh, building up on top. So in an unconfined aquifer, so this would be our top ground. For an unconfined aquifer, you would have something like this, where this would be your water table depth, right? That's unconfined. And uh, this elevation here could be like H prime, okay? Z is equal to H prime. That's just the depth um, 
to your piezometric head. And for a confined aquifer, just kind of, there you go. For a confined aquifer, let's say, it would be something like this. Aquifer. Where in this case, we have some uh, thickness here, B. So B is going to be your aquifer thickness. And your uh, Z is going to be B here, if this is zero, something like that. So just kind of drawing this uh, to label um, your confined, what your confined aquifer looks like and what your unconfined aquifer looks like. Okay. Now, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to integrate every component of this equation. So go back here. We're going to integrate every component of this, this, equation, this equation from zero to our, what we call our, our H or our H prime. I'm just going to use H prime for now. So we're going to integrate from zero to H prime to get our total um, uh, flow through. So this is going to be zero to H prime, zero to H prime, zero to H prime. Okay. So that's, that's all I'm doing is just getting everything uh, to get the total piezometric, to, to integrate it across the total piezometric head. So I'm going to move down and I'm just going to focus on uh, part number one. So we're talking about zero to H prime S sub S DH DT. But since we're integrating from zero to H prime, we're also going to have to include our DZ here, right? Because we're integrating across the entire piezometric, uh, the depth. So this is going to equal DH DT zero H prime S sub S DZ. So that's no longer partial. That's going to be a full. Okay, now this is the part where you're just, you can actually kind of um, memorize this part and have this tabulated somewhere for you if it's, if it's easy. So for an unconfined aquifer, this left-hand side, this first component is S sub Y DH DT. Okay, for a confined aquifer, This is going to be S sub S B D H D T, which is just going to be, um, it's replaced essentially this, uh, um, the specific storage essentially just replaced with a capital S in the book and it's called storativity. And this is going to be D H D T where again, storativity is going to be S sub S, sorry, not the fancy one, S sub S multiplied by B, okay? Now for the second part, that's when we're integrating zero to H bar, and we're talking about D, D, X. K, X, wow, I'm making some mistakes. Okay, there we go, K, X. D H D X multiplied by D Z. Now this is going to be pulling out the D D D X D D X zero H prime K X D H D X D Z. This is going to be D D X K X D H dx multiplied by x from zero to h prime. Now for an unconfined aquifer, okay, this is going, this solution is going to be d dx kx h dh dx. For a confined aquifer, This is going to be D, DX, K, sorry, X, 
B, D, H, D, X, which is D, D, X, T, X, D, H, D, X, where now we've introduced another parameter is T, X. T, X is called transmissivity. And it is K multiplied by B. Kx multiplied by b. Okay. So again, if you go back to, so this is just for one, one and two, but if you go back to our equations here, you see that three and four are essentially similar to, uh, to two. The only thing that's changing is that this is respect with respect to x, this is with respect to y, and this is with respect to Z. So we essentially can repeat this analysis again for sections three and four. Um, so for three, we're going to get for our unconfined aquifer, we get a D, D, X, or sorry, D, D, Y, sorry, D, D, Y, K, Y, H, D, H, D, Y for a confined aquifer. You will have D, D, Y, T, Y, D, H, D, Y. Again, where T, Y is K, Y multiplied by B. Because you're assuming the thickness is going in both X and Y directions. And then for this one's a little bit different now. Um, with part four, so I'm gonna write this out. This is integrating, oops, from zero to H bar, D, D, Z, K, Z, D, H, D, Z, D, Z. Now this is a little bit different. This one's going to be K, Z, D, H, D, Z from zero to H bar, which is going to give us um, KZ, DH, DZ from uh, at H bar, now minus zero. So with this particular case, we're assuming that nothing's coming in from the bottom here. And if, let me spell this out a little bit better. So this is going to be minus kz dh dz at zero. So zero is when we're talking about the bedrock. And we're assuming that this is a, a confined layer. So we're assuming that there's nothing coming in from the bedrock. Okay. Now in this case, this is talking about um, this is talking about percolation into that confined aquifer. Now um, or in, sorry, in that confined or unconfined aquifer. So in this case, this is going to be considered recharge. So this is again is a flux in the z direction into our confined or unconfined aquifer. Okay. So. Now, um, does that kind of make sense that when you're talking about the Z direction, we are talking about, um, in, we're essentially talking about com, uh, recharge coming in. Now, when we're talking about a, a, an, an unconfined aquifer, that recharge is really obvious, right? You have your bedrock, you have your water table depth, and then you have recharge, right? But for uh, an, a confined aquifer, things are a little bit different. So it is absolutely possible that you have recharge kind of coming through if you have a leaky confining layer that could also, that can be contributing to your R. You can also have R coming in 
uh, very, very, very far kind of upstream, like technically upstream of this confining aquifer. So you still can have um, water entering that way as well. It's, it's technically considered in the Z direction because it is coming from above, kind of basically it's like as if somewhere uh, far, far to the left of this confined aquifer is an unconfined aquifer and this R is essentially allowed to kind of enter in this way. So that's that's kind of how we we justify that recharge for a confined aquifer. It's got to be it's got to be recharged somehow. Okay, so let's put it all together. So the first thing we would have is a two D confined aquifer, um, and so that would be S. DH DT is D DX TX DH DX plus D DY TY DH DY plus your recharge. Okay, this is a linear partial differential equation. Okay, it's pretty straightforward to solve. Now, for the 2D unconfined aquifer, if we put things together, we have S, Y, D, H, D, T is D, D, X, K, X, H, D, H, D, X plus D, D, Y, K, Y, H, D H D Y plus my recharge. Now look at this. We have an H here and we have a DH DX, an H and a DH DX. What is this called? When you have this, this is called something. This is a, a nonlinear partial differential equation. So this is nonlinear partial differential equation due to this extra H term. Okay, so that is extremely complicated uh, to solve. So um, we actually need to linearize the system making a few substitutions. So it's extremely difficult. To solve. We can linearize Oops. Um, the system using two substitutions, okay, where uh, H DH DX is equal to one half D DX h squared and similarly for the dy h d h d y is one half d d x i'm sorry that's d plus b a y d y h squared so this is just um this is uh just substitutions from calculus and and uh a linearization of our storage term about a nominal head. So H naught, and we get S Y D H D T is approximately equal to S Y H over H naught, which is S Y two H H not D D T H squared. So if we substitute um, this equation and these two equations into our um, 2D, uh, uh, 2D equation for a, an unconfined aquifer, then we end up with something that still doesn't look pretty, but you know, it's a little bit easier to solve. Mm -hmm. We end up with S Y. 2H naught D H squared 
dt, which is d, dx, kx, one half d h squared dx plus d dy ky to the one half d h squared over dy plus my recharge. Okay, so this is going to be your 2D, um, this is your 2D unconfined. Unconfined. Aquifer. Okay. Um, your book uh, presents these kind of like uh, helpful expression on when you're um, it's, it's a it's full expression on how, how to identify your, these these different equations. Um, I don't I don't particularly like them. Um, I've always just kind of memorized the two different equations, but I'll I'll leave this here if you feel this is helpful. So helpful expression from book. Okay, and this is for a two D homogeneous isotropic aquifer. So before I present the equation, what does homogeneous mean? This means the same Sounds soil, which means your which means your KX and your KY is just your K. It's just the their it's the homogeneous type of soil. Um, what does isotropic mean? Isotropic right. means same in all directions. Um, so there's no um, changes in the directions. So again, that would imply that TX is TY is T. So that's, that's what, um, that's what those, those things mean. Um, so the book pre presents this equation. So C1 D phi DT is D squared phi over DX squared plus uh, D squared phi over dy squared plus r over c2. There, your phi for a unconfined aquifer let me make a nice little table and for a confined aquifer so this would be phi this is going to be C1. Oh, I hope I left enough space. And this is going to be C2. So phi for an unconfined aquifer is H2 over 2. For a confined is H. C1 is SY over KH naught. And this is S over T. And C2, this is K and this is T. So if you make these substitutions back into this equation here, um, if you put these substitutions back in here, you'll arrive at the exact same equations that I derived. Um, I think it's just a way, uh, like a, a short way of you writing it down on your notes. It's, it's helpful. I, I don't know why. I just always go back to the, I just write the whole thing out. And when I work through problems, I'm just going to write it out. Okay. Let's see. Let's talk about simplifications, right? Those are always fun. Okay, so simplifications. If the system movement is primarily in one dimension, so either x or y direction, then we have a 1D form of the equation, right? If, if the problem is essentially saying that we don't have any movement in the, in the y direction, you cross out anything with respect to y. Everything's, you know, there's no movement, so nothing's changing. Um, Okay, now after a long period of time, 
the flow patterns um, are not changing significantly. So this means that we essentially reach steady state conditions. Okay. Um, so an example of this would be, let's say, um, let's say that you are uh, doing some prospecting for a well or something like that. Um, you no one has touched this area in a long time. So you're, you're kind of doing well observations around the area. Um, if no one's been around and no one has touched the wells, then you can assume that whatever measurement you have is, is steady state. If it's steady state, what does that mean for our governing equation? Steady state is essentially saying that we have no changes, no changing uh, H with respect to time. So then if we go back up, to our governing equation here, then this parameter, and actually the whole left-hand side will essentially go away, right? So that D, uh, DT will be equal to zero, okay? So if we go back to that kind of helpful um, equation that they provided to you, then your left-hand side goes to zero, and you get zero is D squared phi, over dx squared plus r over c2. Now this equation in order to solve, so to solve, okay, uh, you must know the boundary conditions. Must know boundary conditions. Which we commonly just denote as BCs. Okay. Um, now, now, if we integrate uh, this equation here twice, then we end up with phi of x, actually, sorry, it's including, no, was I right? Yeah, no, wait a minute. Integrate, integrate. Yeah, 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 I was right. If you integrate this equation, then this is going to be negative r over 2c2 x squared plus a naught x plus a1, where a naught and a1 are integration constants determined by your boundary conditions.